Hello, thanks for clicking on this video. We're going to look at the truth about baptism. Stop almost any Christian from any church in the street and they will agree that an understanding of the Bible and obedience to God's commands are essential to salvation. But if you ask the same people about baptism, it's often a completely different story. If you find somebody that does think that baptism needs to take place, you're then faced with a mountain of diverse methods, understandings and practices. Most of the methods used for baptism today are based on tradition and some are on a sort of a mixture of tradition and scripture, but very often that scripture hasn't been interpreted properly, it's misunderstood. The state of affairs is mainly due to the fact that people bind themselves solely to religious organisation instead of seeking the truth in the Bible. Ephesians 4 verse 5 says, One Lord, one faith and one baptism. So there's only one way that baptism can take place. Only this one baptism is truly acceptable to God. After Jesus' resurrection, we read in Mark 16, Jesus said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptised shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. So we can see that scriptural baptism can only take place when a man or woman is able to understand and obey the word of God. Let's look at the example of Cornelius, who was a Roman centurion. He was known as a good man by any standards. Acts chapter 10 verse 2. A devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God all way. So despite that he was a, a great man, a devout man, he prayed to God all the time and he gave money away. He was still instructed to see the Apostle Peter, who would tell him what else he needed to do. In verse 48, he commanded them to be baptised in the name of the Lord. Another example in Acts chapter 8 is Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water, what doth hinder me to be baptised? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and eunuch, and he baptised him. Another example is when the Apostle Paul was coming out of prison and the jailer brought them out and said, Sirs, what, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. And he was baptised, he and all his, straight away. God has laid down three essential conditions for salvation, and those are knowledge, belief and baptism. The English word baptise has been taken directly from the Greek word baptizo, and that means to dip, plunge or completely immerse in liquid. It is used in Greek art of dying. In order to dye material it has to be completely dipped into the dye so that the material is wholly changed in colour. So the scriptural baptism has to mean that it's completely immersion in water. You are completely immersed in water. Let's have a think about uh, the work of John the Baptist in John chapter 3 verse 22. After these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea, and there he tarried with them and baptised. And John also was baptising in Anon near to Salem, because there was much water there. And they came 
and were baptised. The New Testament leaves us in no doubt that the first baptisms were performed by bodily immersions in rivers and in large pools of water. Even Jesus was totally immersed in baptism by John the Baptist. It's clear that people need to be mature enough to accept the plan of salvation that God has worked out for those who believe in him. Baptism can only be beneficial to people who are prepared to subject themselves to the spiritual meaning and purpose of baptism. If we read the New Testament carefully, we'll find that baptism has a fourfold significance. The first is a washing away or cleansing. The second is the association with the death and resurrection of Jesus. The third is that we are united by baptism into Christ. And the fourth involves a commitment and a change of masters. In other words, a change of allegiance. Let's have a look at the first one then. Acts chapter 22 and verse 16. And now, why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptised, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Can you see the mix of the physical act here, coupled with the spiritual act of washing away sins, just like water washes away dirt from your skin or clothes? Let's have a look at Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. We find the same symbol of washing, making someone clean, used in the Old Testament in Isaiah chapter 1. Wash you, make you clean, put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes, cease to do evil. Can you see how God links washing with putting away evil? So when John the Baptist and then Jesus Christ talked about the waters of baptism, their listeners would have been reminded of familiar scriptures. The second significance of baptism is the association with the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. As we are completely covered by water in the act of baptism, we symbolically die. And as we rise from the water, we symbolically rise to a newness of life. In this, we associate ourselves with the death and resurrection of Jesus. The Apostle Paul explains this to us in Romans chapter 6. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptised into Jesus Christ were baptised into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. But if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. In baptism, we can see that we undergo a figurative resurrection to newness of life. It is a change of outlook that is an essential part of our obedience to God. The Apostle Paul also wrote in Colossians chapter 2, We are buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. The third significant point about baptism is that we are united by baptism into Christ. So if we are united by baptism into Christ, we are also related to Christ and to the promises that God made through him. We're going to look at Galatians chapter 3, verses 7, 16, and then verses 26 to 29. 
Know ye therefore, that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not unto seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. For ye are all the children of God, by faith in Jesus Christ. For as many of you as have been baptised into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. God promised to make Abraham the father of a great people and said that Abraham and his descendants must obey God. In return, God would guide them and protect them and give them the land of Israel. Genesis chapter 12 Now the Lord said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. I will make of thee a great nation, I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. The fourth significance of baptism that I should like to talk about is that it involves a commitment and a change of masters, in other words, a change of allegiance. God is not pleased with the idolatry of the world. Men and women are naturally the servants of sin, but there is another way. So in baptism, we can begin a new life of obedience to God that relates us to the promised gift of God. Romans chapter 6. But now, being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. If we utterly reject the way of humanity, the way of the world, we can turn through the obedient act of baptism unto God's way, obeying the gospel, which contains the powerful message of the salvation that God is offering to us. The world of Noah's day was filled with violence and wickedness. Noah built an ark, and when the water of the flood destroyed the rest of the world, Noah and his family entered the ark and were saved. 1 Peter chapter 3 Which sometime were disobedient, when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. And the word soul there simply means a living creature. That's all it means. Like f the like figure, whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The judgment of the wicked when Christ returns will be sudden and final, as it was in the days of Noah. As Noah in the ark was saved, so we, if we are in Christ, shall have hope of salvation. We have seen that the way to be in Christ is through knowledge, belief, baptism and continued obedience. If we obey the word of God as closely as we can, we can have the hope of a fresh start in baptism. Those things which may do wrong in our new life in Christ can be forgiven by prayer to God through our newfound Saviour, Jesus Christ. When we repent and ask for God's forgiveness, all our sins and errors are blotted out from the record, and therefore we can go forward daily, confident that if we try to do the right thing, God has promised to mercifully forgive.